So before we start, let us uh, pray. I let come in. As we approach the throne of God. Father, as we come before you, first we want to thank you so much for taking us safely through another, through another um, uh, day, uh, almost to the end of the week. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your blessings. And the Lord, we pray that as we go through this weekend, this extended weekend of um, financial seminar, that you would be with us, that you would um, enlighten all of our minds. Lord, help me, give me the things I need to say, and um, help as we discuss um, these things that are very important, that we would not only discuss, but we would be obedient to your words, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I will, uh, you know, you have your program, and I suggest you hold on to that, right? Uh, we have a few things um, to do. The seminar format will be whatever there are things that are going to be repeated each night all right as a again as a teacher i know that repetition it's it's not just a saying repetition deepens impression trust me it's not just a saying um, it's how i get things in my head It's constantly going through it doing different things so there are things that we'll do tonight that won't happen uh, again but there are I believe, you know, I've been praying ever since um, I, uh, Linda called me and I agreed to do this. I started working on the presentation and even up to last night I was working on them because as God um, gives me different things, I put them in. And so what I've done is done some repetition in there, so we'll help. Uh, we have our notepads that we need to use. Now, I will say this, at the end of tonight's um, presentation, the last slide, I just thought about it when I got home. I put my email address on it. So I have not, nothing I prepare, you will see copyright on. And people ask me that all the time. Why don't you copyright what you do? I said, why? I'm not selling it. I don't plan to sell it. I don't care who uses it. I hope people use it, right? So if you want it, you can just email me. So the last slide will have, and um, hopefully I'll remember to put my email on the other slides too. Uh, other presentation but if you want it if you know if you're going to share it with someone if you want it for yourself please feel free email me I will send it to you again I don't copyright anything I do uh, the other thing before we get in I need to let you know is there is no magic pill when it comes to finances you know it's it's easier to get into debt than to get out of debt you know I've been studying finances for more than 30 years and I have not perfected it. Um, I will tell you this from a personal standpoint. It used to bother me. Before I used to follow God as closely as I do now, it bothered me because as the, as the person in the family who took on the financial um, responsibility, the, when things weren't working out as they should, and I'm like, well, you have the training. What's going on, right? You, you have studied, you, you have this, you have done this. Why are things not working out? And I didn't realize it because the, the God element was missing. So I'll tell you that all the degrees I have and all the studies I've done, the best financial advice I found is in the Bible. And so, yes, there are other things, you know, that we can help, and I'm glad for my training. And I told my wife a number of times, now I know why I got the training the way I got it. It was to use for God's service, right? So you will find that most of the presentations have, um, you know, a lot of um, scriptures in there because it's the way I live my life. It's the way I teach, even, uh, you know, my accounting and finance classes. So tonight uh, um, is titled um, Financial Advice for Families. We're going to do some questions in here. Uh, if you have... There is, there are going to be questions that may come from the, from, you know, the congregation that others may have answers to. I don't know everything, don't pretend to know any, everything, but I know enough to help you, but I'm sure there are experiences that 
can be had. Um, now, Allison, did you get your notepad and your pen? All right, good. I have to make sure, right? I have to take care of my Jamaican friend, you know? All right, so we're going to talk about some stuff. And um, so I saw this uh, picture, and I thought it was so uh, cute. It says, it's, it, it says here, the world is heading for a cashless society. Uh, I always thought you and I were way ahead of our time. And we are supposedly heading to a cashless society. And so those guys figure we're just finally catching up to them. So we'll start with a, a question, all right? Um, it says, now it's weird. <laughs> One of the things that um, we will do, Jerry, if you don't mind after we're done, I'm going to have us flip through a couple of the other slides because on my computer, that yellow is green. <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the things I tell my students whenever they're going to do presentations is to always, if you can, go to the room and check your slides. Because my daughter, um, you know, and by the way, you know, if, I, if there's any tax questions come up, I'll defer to her. She's the tax accountant in the family. If we've always seen where you create something and it looks perfect on your computer till you show it up on another one. So when she comes up to school and she um, educates and, and guides my students into creating PowerPoint slides, she always tells them that. Well, the first question is, who is primarily responsible for the finances in a marriage relationship? Both. Uh, so both, C, okay. Um, everybody agrees with C? All right, what do you agree? B, all right, all right. So we have B. Anyone else? All right, Marin? You think it's A? Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this. And remember what I said. I come from a biblical perspective. In, in spite of what I know, there are many things that I have studied, and I will teach it to my students, and I'll say, this is what the world says. But here's what my Bible say, okay? So the actual answer is A, and I will show you scripture why that is the case, right? Because here's the deal. One of the things that, um, you know, in Ephesians where it talks about uh, wives should submit to their husbands and husbands should uh, love um, their wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself, uh, you know, we've been in churches where people look at my wife like she's crazy. Because they're like, what is the... And when she tells them, she says, listen, I didn't set the rules. God set the rules. And God says, I'm supposed to submit to my husband. And he's supposed to love me enough to die for me. Right? And so too often in churches, we, we follow the world with many things. But let's check some stuff out says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now, notice I didn't say who should manage the finances, right? I said who is primarily responsible. So if the husband is head of the wife, that means the husband has to be head of everything. Okay? God holds us. This is not a position. Let me tell you, as a husband, ladies, I am telling you this. This is not a position to be coveted. My wife will tell you, I stress out being a husband because I know that God is going to hold me responsible for everything that happens in it. Now, what do I mean? As long as I've done my part, and if my wife chooses or my children choose to go their way, that's different. But God holds me responsible for everything that happens in my house because this comes from his word, not mine. Okay? Then says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own, notice the word, right? Didn't say there, says his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Didn't put the responsibility on the wife. The responsibility is on whom? Now, when, when if we go back to um, the Garden of Eden, whose sin 
cause us to be in this situation? Adam sinned. But who sinned first? Exactly. That's the rule. Now, uh, I can't remember, and I, I, I meant to look up the quote, and it's not finance related. I meant to look up the quote, and I forgot, where Sister White speaks of giving guidance why women should be careful not to try and usurp the role of the, the, the man in the relationship, because she says, next to God, the woman's role in the house in terms of raising and taking care of the family a certain way is the most important. Next to God. But many have abdicated that role to take on roles that are not theirs. And so it's not necessary. And, and by the way, when I do this presentation similar, it doesn't matter if I do it in public. They know who they're getting. They're getting a Christian and a lot of people are like, no, we don't believe that. I say, it doesn't matter what you believe. You ask me to do the presentation. I'm telling you what I believe based on the Bible. I was doing a presentation at a student leadership conference that has like seven, 700, 800 students. And when I sent my presentation to them, one of the slides towards the end says, pray before you do certain things. And they came back to me and they said, could we remove that? I said, if you remove that, I'm still going to say it. So it could either be removed from the slide. No, this is not a Christian. This is a worldly prayer. But there are certain things I, I hardly ever do anything without praying. Okay? And if I forget to pray, then I ask God to, to forgive me. Okay? So again, we have to remember, we cannot let the world tell us how we behave. We have to let the Bible, God's words, tell us how to do that. So, now, here's another question. What is the most important first step to take towards achieving your financial goal? Let's say you're working. All right? Let's say you're working. What do you think? I deliberately made it a little bit difficult. All right, you said D, put yourself on a tight budget to get spending under control. Maybe, maybe C, figure out which goals are achievable and your net worth. Yeah. Any, all right, so, so let me tell you, let me tell you what um, the world says first, and I'll give you that answer, right? The world tells us to do this first. Okay? This is what the world tells us to do first. But the true answer for me, and I chose not to, it depends on your situation at time. Because first thing, not everybody's working that are at the stage where they, you may be past that stage. But I am telling you what the finance books tell us right, to do this. But again, you may be doing that and, um, or you may choose to do something else. Like my wife and I, you know what we're doing? We're putting away money to buy a country property. Now we do, unfortunately, we have funds stuck in 401, well, 403B, because we both work for not-for-profit organizations, and so we can't really pull those funds now, but we wish we could, okay? Uh, not only because we're not at the, the retirement age to do that, but the bottom line, this is what you would normally see, but again, I'd say, or it depends on your situation. Like, for instance, I really like D that says put yourself on a tight budget. How many people actually have a budget? All right, you see that? We're going to talk about budgets, right? We're going to talk about budgets. Um, and, and, and each time. Because, do, you know, when I ask my students, when I ask my students if they have a budget, they're like, but that, we don't have a budget. We don't make enough money. I said, that's why you need a budget. You see, you make all the money like Jim makes, you don't need a budget. You know, the people who have a lot of money, everyone should have a budget, but the ones who have money that, not that we should ever waste money, that can waste money, they don't need it like the, 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 the less money you have, the more you need a budget. You need to know where every penny goes. Right? So that's why I say. So I put stuff in there that makes sense. I said, work hard so you'll get promoted. Well, listen, 
I would put that as way out there. You know, you work hard not just to get promoted, right? You work hard because we work unto God, not to man, right? But, you know, I mean, that's what the world says. But, you know, figure out which goals are achievable and your net worth. We'll talk about net worth. That's a good one. So it depends on where you are. But like I said, you know, and I do this in my classes. I tell the students what the world says, and then I talk to them about everything is not always as cut and dry, okay? So I deliberately may put this one here to kind of bother you a little bit. It says, financial planners generally stress the importance of starting to save and invest early. Why would they do that? No, my fault. Uh, it means you will need the service. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Linda said that's probably why they do it. They really want your money. That's what she said. All right. All right. Anyone else? All right. I would go with A on this. It helps to build good habits, right? This is one of the reasons why you tell your kids start saving early. I remember as, you know, I grew up in an extremely poor family. And my parents, we, would, we couldn't afford to, to buy you know, piggy banks like the rich folks like Carol. So what we, my, my dad did, we had, but we had access to bamboo. And, uh, so, and so we'd cut them a, a little above each joint. And then, because then you could cut a little hole in there and drop your, your pennies and your stuff in there, right? And my, my parents taught us to save that way. And um, I kind of taught my son to save uh, in a different way. But then he, when he was at home, you know, and he's not here, but his wife is. She can go tell him. It's okay. It's true anyway. Um, when we were at home, he would save so much. And then whenever he wants something, he goes to his mama <laughs> and spend our money that way and save his money. But you know what? I don't mind because when he and his wife um, got married, they were able to go buy their own place, right? Many kids can't say that. I mean, how old were you guys just when? So he was 23, she was 22. Bought their own. We didn't buy a house till we were in our early 30s. You know what I'm saying? But that savings helps. So when you teach them early, and, and for those who have grandkids, you teach them, right? You may want to start them with something. Say here, Here's what you can do. But it builds, it really builds good habit. Because I still have the habit of saving. Uh, now, I believe in storing up treasure where? Hey, listen. I, and it's not because I want a mantra. It's because that's what the Bible tells me to do. And so I think it's a good, it's a good thing to do, right? Because um, some people, well, I want this mansion. Who? I don't want a mansion. I just want to be in heaven. And someone was talking to me at um, the church I spoke last time. The, the greeter was just so pleasant. And I said, you know, that's one of your gifts. She says, well, I think this is my gift. I said, well, you carried out very well. And so she's like, you know, a lot of people want to go get this in heaven and that. She says, I just want to be there. And I, so I said to her, you know what I was thinking one day? That if the angels are not the ones, so Marion, this is for us and you know, Daryl, us greeters, you know, and maybe because I'm one of the greeters, I, this came to my mind. I said, if the angels are not greeting us when we get there or whoever, it may be that the greeters have to be there first to greet. So I'm like, Carol, welcome to heaven. <laughs> All right, so, um, so what is this one? What is a good question to ask yourself before incurring a large expense? Any, any, eh? Oh, should Bill Gates, you know, uh, so should Linda's cousin, if he's doing it, <laughs> would Bill Gates have spent his money this way? Uh, you'd got, no one wants to join Linda. Um, <laughs> Linda is like heaven. Uh, would Bill Gates do that? <laughs> right, yeah. Should I go into the, do you know, I have known, and this has happened in my extended family, where people will go into debt based on what they think their raise of pay is going. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Talking about counting chickens before they hatch. How about have the money first? You know, when I came to this country, it, 
it kind of baffled my mind. Growing up in Jamaica, we didn't, only if you were a business, you had credit cards. There were no credit cards for individuals or debit cards, you know, whatever, ATM cards. And I remember going to the, the bookstore because I came straight, went to college and paying for my stuff. And I saw these people just getting stuff and they were sliding piece of plastic. And I'm like, what is happening there? And they're like, well, you can do that and pay later. I said, what? What if I don't have the money later? <laughs> so I was never, and I was fortunate. You know, one of the things um, that I did was when I was um, dating my wife, you know, we discussed debt because I wasn't going to marry anybody with a lot of debt. I just wasn't. That was top on, on my list. I was not going to put myself in that, you know. Uh, and um, when my students and I talk, I said, listen, I'm just going to be honest. When you, I know I did a financial counseling and I almost had to become a psychologist helping this one couple because I was doing their, you know, they, after a session, a one financial presentation at their church. And I, and I will tell you this, if you want me to sit with you individually or as a couple, I'll do that, right? It's, uh, whenever I do this after, because there are certain things, I don't mind doing it, you know, I, I don't mind doing it. I think God has blessed me a certain way, and to me, if he blesses you somewhere, you share it, right? And I remember meeting with them the first time and just asking about different things and how they got into debt, because I need to understand the mindset, you know? Uh, one of the things I did in school was I took like, gosh, I don't know how many psychology classes. And they're like, why are you doing this? You don't even have to do it. I said, I want to learn about people. And I specifically took ones that talk about relationship, you know, how you thought, you know. After, uh, as long as only, I took some that I had to take the prerequisite to get to that class, but I did anyway. At St. Leo, no, I don't have to do that. I just ask a psychology professor, can I sit in your class? And I do that, right? And so I learned to read people very, uh, pretty decently and um, talking. And I could see as the wife was talking about how she got into this, that the husband was getting angry. And so I, I stopped, you know, and I said, hey, uh, let me talk to him a little bit. And we stepped outside and I, I spoke with him and I reminded him that he, the contract was signed, you know, he was married, there's no divorce going on, right? So I had to do a little divorce Bible study with him to let him know it wasn't going to happen. So this is, what, this is who you have. We're going to have to work through it. Uh, and so finances um, is a big deal, you know? And so I wasn't going to get into that. Uh, I wasn't going to, literally, I wasn't going to marry someone with a lot of debt. So I was glad that my wife only had a few thousand dollars of student loans, you know, and I didn't get into much. I worked hard, you know. I worked a full-time job and went to school full-time. I slept. Uh, it was good to be a Seventh-day Adventist because that's when I got the most sleep. But I literally slept three hours a night during the, during the rest of the, the, the week because I was not going into debt to get my education, you know. Um, so... And I know people will tell you, it's a good debt. Hey, listen, I don't know any debt that's a good debt. <laughs> I'm just going to, as a finance person, I'm telling you I'm going against the grain. They will tell you this is a good debt. I have a house, but it's still not a good debt. I wish someone would pay it off for me. <laughs> okay? We have to make that mortgage payment. All right, it says, once I've ranked my priorities and I'm working towards them, is it a bad thing to change my mind? Read through and tell me what you think. Any, any answers? All right, so I hear some C's going on here. All right, so any, any others? So here is the appropriate answer. It's, is it a bad thing? Problem. You know why? You see, that sea is too easy to fall into. That trap is too easy to fall into. Where it says, in fact, your priorities are likely to change over time anyway, and you should be prepared for that. Let me tell you, your priorities change, but 
I am telling you that when you have set those, if you truly sit down and you think about what you want to achieve, like for instance, you know, my wife and I a number of years ago, um, and she was there way before me. She said, you know, we decided after watching a few sermons on YouTube that we needed to get out of Wesley Chapel and get a country property where we can plant our own food. And for whatever reason, God hasn't seen fit to have our house. We put our house on the market, didn't sell. Our agent told us to pull it off. Then he told us the other day that we should put it back on. So we did. Uh, but once we made that decision, we have started putting funds away towards that buying a property that we can plant our own food, that we can do certain things on, because, and also try to do some, you know, as much of the stuff like Sister White says, we should be an outpost, right? If we, we would like to buy big enough, you know, something five, maybe 10 acres, that if someone, um, you know, in the time of trouble, if we um, live through that, and someone have an RV or something, they need to pull up on it, you pull up on it, right? Uh, so we want a small house on it, but big property, so that other people can be there, you know. But we have had a number of things come up in between that. The devil knows how to change your priorities. And that's the danger right there. The devil knows how. So you pray about it. So when you're setting up priorities, pray to God to help you discuss it. Come up with real priorities, right? And then stick to them, you know, stick to them says, all right, negative financial information excluding bankruptcy. The reason I'm excluding bankruptcy, because bankruptcy is a little tricky in terms of how long it stays on your credit report. Credit report. There are a number of different things that can affect that. There's a minimum time, but then it could be extended. So it says negative financial information excluding bankruptcy can stay on your credit report for how many years? Seven, ten. All right, so it's generally seven. All right, so now why do I say generally seven? So I'm going to give you an example of what happened. So my, um, my wife and one of her sisters went into a dealership, a car dealership, and they bought the same type car. It was a terrible car. It was Dodge Neon. That's the, I never let my wife go buy a car by herself again. She said, but it looks cute. No, you don't buy a, a terrible car because it looks cute. Okay, and so she bought a, a bright red um, one, which is fine, you know, the red wasn't that bad, uh, but it's the type of car. A couple of years later, we had to get rid of it. The car just started giving so much problems. I said, did you look at consumer report that we pay for? <laughs> no, she didn't look at that. She and her, her sister then bought a Barney Purple Neon. I think they thought it was cool. Um, my wife walked out with a 3.9% interest rate, our sister walked out with, I think, an 11.9% interest rate. Now, and she says, that doesn't make sense. I have taken care of all my things. She had filed bankruptcy. She had had some issues, you know, um, including her husband that put them in debt, divorced her, you know, and, um, but she's like, Pissar, this doesn't make sense. I said, it shouldn't. But even though they say it should go off, it, they can access the information. I work for um, a subdivision of one of the credit bureaus, Equifax. And I am telling the information is there. So they may tell you they're not using it. But unfortunately, they do. Right? Unfortunately, they do. So it's supposed to. That's what the law says. But let's be honest. You walk into an interview and you have a company that a bunch of male chauvinists in, and you are the most qualified female, don't you think they're going to find a reason not to give you the job? But it's not going to be because you're a female. I remember I had to call. I, I, I almost lost my job this way. I was in New York, and it was a female doing this to another female. And I remember we interviewed, I think, three, three individuals, and the, the, the young lady was the most talented by far. 
And they were pretty much even on resume, but as far as the type of questions we asked, and we needed someone really good, so we asked some tough questions. She handled herself well. She did not get flustered. She knew what she was talking about. And then after you know, me and the others say, all right, this is who we're going to hire, she said, no, because I don't work well with women. I said one thing, E-E-O-C. <laughs> That's all I said, and I walked out of the meeting. And she looked at me. I knew my time at that company was coming to an end because I would, you know, when you deal with money, you have to be very careful, right? And so my wife had wanted to um, move to Florida, so we moved to Florida. But I will not protect myself by not doing the right thing. But, and they end up hiring. I stayed at the company a few months later uh, still because I told my wife, you first go to Florida because she had family here. You get a job, find a house, and then I'll come. And, um, but I knew. Things changed for me. I was supposed to get a promotion. Another guy got it. But I can't, you, know, you know when you get yourself in trouble, right? But it, to me, that was good trouble because the young lady was hired, and she did a wonderful job, right? Uh, and then later, before I left, I said, what was that all about? She said, well, you know, women tend to hold grudges with each other a lot. Uh, and you guys, you could slug it out and then ask each other to go to lunch later. I say, it doesn't matter. That's your perception. The bottom line, she was the most qualified, you know? And so, again, it should come off, but it doesn't always. So why am I telling you this? As much as possible, try not to have negative information on it. I've seen, you know, I've seen people who had some hard times and, and then we'll talk about things to help you, help yourself with these things. But hard times, and they, they made some things slip, and then it follows them for a long time. It, it, it really does. It says, which of the following best defines your network? So, what do you think is your network? Remember that phrase came up earlier, your network? What do you think is your network? Somebody says C, B. That's okay. We don't hold it against you. We're not holding it against you. All right. So the answer is C. Why? Because network takes all your ads. So everything. So when you go for a loan and they say they have to check out your network, that, this is why they ask you for everything you have. Everything. So everything you own and then they look at everything you owe, and then they come up with what you're worth. Unfortunately, some people are in the negative. You know, they can't, and what I mean by that, because you may be positive um, on a month to month, but if your house is le worth less than you owe on it, that throws you negative, and then that negatively impacts you, right? So I always, you know, tell, um, tell, People, when they're, you know, I talk to them and they're going to buy a house, I say, honestly, if you do not have 20% or more to put down, don't buy a house. You're not ready to buy a house. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm just telling you. Because if the market shifts one way or another, again, I, I hate, you know, my wife, I didn't know better. So when we bought our house the first time, we put on like 5% because, you know, they said we could. But again, I'm proud of my daughter and her son. They put down like 20-something percent, okay? And so when, if the market shifts a little bit here or there, it could push you one way or another, you know? And so those are things you want to save for, right? If you really, that's, those are those priorities that you say, I want a house, I'm going to start putting away everything, you know, and, uh, and do that. So again, when, whenever you go in and they say, well, your net worth is so-and-so, they're taking everything, so don't hide stuff from them. You know, they, you know uh, at least right now, they're not trying to take away everything from you. You could negatively impact yourself if you hold out, if you have some asset that you didn't tell them about. Like, for instance, let's say you have a nice vintage car that's worth $30,000, $60,000. Well, you're like, I don't owe anything. Eh, they don't need to know about that. No, that goes in, and that changes the percentage you get because that's something you own, and especially if you own it free and clear, 
it boosts up your network network what they are saying now is therefore they can give you a better interest rate right because you have more assets to come from than another person right so a person could be making a lot more money than you uh, as far as um, their pay but if they have a better overall network you're going or if you have a better overall network you're going to get a better interest rate because it's not just your current salary, it's what do you look like. Because someone could be making a lot of money, but most of it is going into paying what? Debt. All right? So you have to think about that. It says, what percent of your income should be spent on monthly mortgage? If you have a house, you know, or even, so we could replace that with rent, okay? If you don't have a mortgage. What do you think? A? Eh? How about whatever you are comfortable with? Now, you know what people do? I think I can do this one and still buy food, right? And it is A. Why is that? Because Notice, let me back it up so you can see probably. No more than 25% of the gross or 35% of your take home, right? And even that, you have to be careful because some people, they have a lot coming out of their take home pay, right? So you have to be careful not to just go, that is the general guide, but you also have to think about, in, in, in a sense, what makes sense, all right? What makes sense. Um, so, but that's general guide, you know? <laughs> now, do you know B? I've seen many people fall in that B trap where the bank says, you know, when my wife and I go, you know, we have, for whatever reason, we have bought and sold a number of houses and whenever we go in, we qualify on one person. Either me or her. Doesn't matter. And they're like, why? Why do you only want to qualify? They're like, are both of you going to be on loan? Yes. But why you want to qualify? I said, because if one of us loses our job, we need to still pay the mortgage. I know people, and I've done financial consulting with people, they're so maxed out even though both of them are working. I'm not talking about situations where two people are working and then one loses a job. I'm talking about they max themselves out so much on a house. You know, it always, I always wonder why two, two people with um, one and a half children and a dog need 4,000 square foot house to live in. More cleaning you have to do, and if you're like my family, uh, you know, we clean our house like <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and I mean, at least once a week, but sometimes two, three times, because both of us have this thing about, you know, when we walk into our house, it needs to be welcoming at all times. You know, uh, I actually prefer to go to my house coming from a vacation than leaving my house to go. Because when we go to the vacation, here's what my wife does. She takes the cavicide stuff from her work, and I have to go walking for a while because she cleans down that hotel. But hey, they, we leave a cleaner hotel room than when we got there. Right? So, but I never understand that. So some, sometimes we put ourselves in place where we buy way too much houses. You know? After our children left, after Pierce left, we sold our house in Seven Oaks and then moved to a smaller house. Because, you know, and the only reason we have a three bedroom is because I need a workout room because I have to work out. And then we have a guest room just in case somebody needs somewhere to stay. It says, how much should you have in an emergency account? See, they tell you six months. It's hard though, let's just be honest. I mean, it took us a long time before we got there. It is real, and why is that? Because if you lose a job, sometimes it takes a while for someone you know, to get back. So that's the ideal. Okay? But I've learned this. I've learned this. I, and believe me on this. Because God has taken care of my wife and I in this situation. That if you are faithful to God and you can't, even if you have nothing, but it's not because you wasted it, God will take care of you. This is why I trust the Bible so much. He's done, I, I'll give you an example. So we're in New York and my wife make was at the time making like um i was in school because she's like no you need to go back to school because i to finish up because i was working going to school so i spent like the last year 
and um, of my three year time in school and, uh, and did that. But be, you know, while she was the one working and she's doing very well. You know, every two weeks she got paid. We were good, we were taking care of stuff. And then she had our son. Well, I came from Jamaica where the companies, when a woman has a child, they get paid for like six months. And depending, and depending how long you could accumulate and even take off a year and still got paid. Now, remember, Jamaica is a third world country. The U.S. is a first world country. So I thought, they got this. They, no, 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 no. Let me just be very transparent. My wife's net pay every, or net pay every two weeks was almost $3,000. And, you know, cost of living wasn't that bad. You know, our apartment we lived in was, uh, we paid like, and that was one of the, the more expensive ones. It was like $800 per month, you know, and it included a bunch of stuff, but you know, we like to live in nice places, so we got one. We could have done like a 600 and still be fine. But after she had the baby, after she left work, they literally, I, by the way, I just not too long graduated, was looking for a job. I graduated during a recession, so jobs weren't just there for you. After she got a letter from 1199, right? If you're in uh, the Union, if you're in New York, you'll know about 1199 Union. They told her every two weeks for six weeks. I didn't know that a mother could bond with a child within six weeks. So that threw me for a loop. I said, what? Six weeks? And then you have to go back to work? So what's going to happen to this boy? You know? And um, she says, yeah. You know what they told her? 230 something dollars every two weeks so now I am not working she's dropping from almost three thousand dollars every two weeks to 230 and every day I'm literally pounding the pavement you see uh, some people don't know what that means it means where you walk and find a job you see pounding the pavement for young people is jumping on Google <laughs> and and I was walking and trying to find jobs because I'm how do and I'm praying every day. And every job offer I got, tell me what was the one problem, Sabbath. I even had one with a great company was going to pay me very well. AIG, American International Group. They'll pay me very well. They said, you'll have to travel about 25% of the time. I said, I probably can conv convince my wife that that's necessary. But then they said, but we saw this on your, and you may never have to work on the Sabbath. <laughs> and I say, you know that may never have to? Not good. Back then we didn't have cell phones. So I said, you have my home number. If you can change, if you change that and say, I will never have to work on the Sabbath. And they said, do you have a job? I said, no. And, but they didn't know that my wife was about to lose everything but 200 and something. Well, let me tell you this. As so we had some savings that we depleted, but right after her last paycheck came in and we were pretty much at the end, close to the end, God found me a job. And here's how he found me a job. He wanted to see how I would react or respond to certain things. And so I couldn't get a job and I got called for a temporary job. And they said two weeks and they were paying me well. Um, two weeks uh, for the temporary job. One, the assistant controller was out on break. Or, no, she was on maternity leave, so they had been using different temps. And, um, and I guess they didn't like the ones before. And so what they asked me to do in two weeks, I got done in two and a half days. And they said, how did you get that done so fast? I said, well, I see patterns and I can quickly do stuff. And so they're like, but do you have another job? I said, no. Again, they don't know that we're running out of money, right? Not their business. And I, you know, I told my wife, I said, I finished the thing. You know, they gave me. So they're like, well, we'll let you work out the rest of the week. They had a bank reconciliation that nobody could reconcile. And so as soon as I heard that, you know what I did? I just prayed. And I, 
I didn't ask God to help me. I told God he wasn't going to help me to do that, right? <laughs> because I need to fix this for these people. And so I did, and I went home. A couple of days later, they called me back and offered me a full-time job. Now, I could have taken the other way and said, man, I'm going to spread out this two weeks, and I would have been probably let go like the other temps, right? So, and I could give you more stories how oh, God has helped me, right? So, uh, but again, this six-month thing is not hard or fast. All right. It says, how early should you ask your children to leave your home? She's already leaving. <laughs> Just saying. See that? That's all she thinks she needs, a, a warm coat and her little buggy thing, right? So um, don't use her. She's not typical. <laughs> so what do you think? A, 18, C, all right. So many, many people think 18, right? But let me tell you this, it depends. Because there are many children, they're still children. I don't care what they call themselves. You know, my, he, 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 different stats say that their brains are not, and Anna probably can give me better information here, their brains are not even developed till they're in their mid-twenties anyway. So you're going to send out somebody whose brain not fully developed at 18-year-old? They, they're going to just get in a mess. Now, God has blessed some of us to be more matured at certain ages, right? But it depends. You have to work, and it depends what they're doing. If you have a child at home that's going to school, right, doing what they need, why are you going to kick them out? You know, because that's kind of what we do. You know, one thing I am really appreciative of my parents with all their kids. I was 26 when I got married. My wife was 28. I left my parents' house and took my wife from her parents' house. Why? Because while I was going to school and working, I was contributing. You know, now, what they did to teach me, continue to teach me good habits, even though they didn't need the money, they had all of us contributed all their children going to school we all lived in the house going to school and they had us contributed to the bills right and then what my mom would do is whenever one of us needed help then because they put the money out then they would take it and help us but it was about building certain character in us right and so it depends you know you have to know now if you have someone graduate I'm coming down if you have someone graduate sitting home all they're doing is eating your food hey they need to go Right now. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they've left your house yet, though. Even though they're at college, they don't necessarily leave your house yet, right? Yeah, but they, oh, trust me, as a teacher, you know what they call home? They call their, their, their parents' home home. I was just talking to this young lady today, uh, working out an internship for her. She's from Jamaica. And I said, all right, so you're, I, we were, she's like, well, where are you going? I said, I'm heading to my car. She's like, I'll walk with you and we'll talk. Then I'll head back to the dorm. I said, head home. She's like, no, 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 home is Jamaica. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, we're, yeah, well, I, like, my dad was kicked out when he was like 12. <laughs> You know, so, uh, but again, if your, peer, if your children are respectful, they're doing what they need to do. I remember I was in Georgia teaching at a university, and this young lady, and she did very well, and we were talking about her going to grad school, and she's like, man, I don't know, you know, because they don't have, you don't have as much funding, you know, you have the financial aid going into your undergraduate program, but unless you get fellowships or assistantships outside, you don't get the Pell Grant, the this, the that, right? Uh, so I said, how's home life? And she said, oh, my parents, great. I said, so you're heading back to Atlanta? Yes. I said, then why don't you go home and continue going to grad school and live at home? I said, is that a problem? She's like, no, but you know, I've been living on my own for the la last four years. I said, listen, you're going to put yourself in debt to try and work while you're going to grad school. Now, why do that? That young lady took my advice, went home, and 
she did got her graduate now she does very well she can't, she keeps up in touch with, keeps in touch with me so that's why i said it depends it depends on the situation right but don't you know i knew this one guy he um at another church that we used to be and he would tell his kids all the time soon as you're 18 you're out of here that's what my parents did to me and i say you know the stress it is terrible sometimes right i say you know the stress you're creating for them when you do stuff like that and so you want to help <laughs> you know and so again we need to be very we need to wise, be wise you know about um where you remember where isaac was when abram sent to get a wife for him where was he home home okay so I'm not saying it works for everyone. It, the situation depends, right? But the world says, get rid of them quickly, all right? And you know what um, a pastor's wife told my son? When my son, you know, was in school and he's getting his master's and he was working, you know, uni um, St. Leo offered him a job and then they say, and we'll pay for your education. And, but he was at home, you know? And she said, oh, no, you need to go out there on your own and that, 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 that. So I, I went to her and I said, let me explain this to you. You're a pastor's wife. Um, what is your financial background? She, she says, I didn't do fine. I said, please don't advise my son financially again. I said, please don't. Because it wasn't her place to do that. He didn't ask her for advice. She asked him what he was planning and then she told him what he needed to go do. And he was not too pleased, but I'm glad he didn't answer her. He came to me and let me address it, you know. And so, um, but don't do that. Don't go telling, you know, he, she doesn't know the relationship we have, right, and, and stuff like that. So, you know, I, again, I've always been very careful when I advise students to ask questions. And I tell them, if I'm going to advise you, and, and I'll say this, if any of you want me to help you, if you're not willing to be truthful, I cannot help you. And I'll tell you this. God has blessed me with discernment. And a lot of times when people are talking to me, they're lying. And I said, all right, are you going to tell me the truth? Because I, I don't know how to be beat around the bush too much, you know. And, and, that, and I said, what are you holding back? I said, seriously, what is it that you're holding back? And then they're like, well, this. I said, how am I going to help you if you're not telling me the truth? If you're not giving me every single thing. If you go to a doctor and you don't tell them all the things that are happening, how are they going to help you? Right? And so your finances is no different. You have to be willing to do. And then you have to be willing to do what you should be doing. All right. So you have heard about the boomerang children? Who are the boomerang children? They leave because, you know, they go. There. And some of them have good enough reasons. You know, if you lose your job because of different, but some of them, they think they're all that, right? They go there, they waste all their money, and then they come back. And look at the, you see how the parents, they're not even happy. Um, but he's just eating off their food, and, you know, they, but here's the problem. They're probably paying for that cell phone that he's texting on. You're not going to have any phone. Get him a, one of them, phone that all you can do is call home <laughs> but you know what should you do with your boomerang children what do you think yeah agree on a plan don't just let them stay there forever if they have gone because some of them will you know it's because um work, life is too hard out there yeah i know but you live in the hard world deal with it Deal with it, right? But, you know, work out something with them and help them get back on their feet. I think most parents that that happened, that happened to one of my brothers. Unfortunately, he didn't have to lose his house, so he didn't boomerang, you know. But we had to help him through a tough time. He lost his job. He was an accountant. Well, well was, because he decided he wasn't going back into accounting. But through the recession, he lost his job. And so we're like, hey, how are things going? What was your mortgage? And so as siblings and my parents, we helped him through that time. So he was kind of a boomerang child, only that he, fortunately, he lived like um, a few blocks down the street. So my parents would um, cook for him, do the, you know, to help him out. But then he got himself back on his feet, right? 
but they worked out a plan with him. Hey, here's what you need to do, right? So I think he was, um, while he was on unemployment, he didn't even last too long on it. He started looking for a job, and he got jobs that had nothing to do with his field. You know, there was a time he was working three different jobs to get himself back where he needed to. And then, you know, one of those, and they were all part-time jobs, obviously, and one of them turned out that they really appreciate and became a full-time job. You know, so you have to work out something with them. You know, you have to work out something. You made them pay, but they have no money to pay. Remember, <laughs> uh, what if they have a job? Make them pay. Yeah. 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 Hey, it makes sense. No, they, they need, you know, you help them to, 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 to get to that point. You know, you help them to get to the point. Like our daughter, our, our, our daughter and her family, um, they are, um, you know, they live in one of our houses and we rent it to them. You know, we don't rent it to them for market price, but we, you know, we, we could let them live in it, but no. They need to be responsible. Now, what we did tell them is to save, right? I said, save so you can buy your own place. You know, I was talking to a parent uh, last Friday, and I taught the daughter. And I, so I saw the mom, and I said, hey, how is Sydney doing? She's like, oh, she's at home eating our food. I said, what are you talking about? This young lady makes $50,000 a year. I said, you're charging her rent? Oh, no. I said, I said, listen, we have a good relationship. Let's just be straight. You're screwing up the kid. I said, I, would. I said, she makes $50,000 a year. I think she could pay something. She's eating your food. So then later, her, so both her parents work at school. Her, her, um, her dad is the chef, you know, because St. Leo, we're fortunate. We actually have chefs, um, not cooks, you know, so we really get... If I ate all that food that we shouldn't be eating, I would get really good food. Like, for instance, when I still ate fish, you know, we get salmon and, you know, really good food they make for us. Say, Sometimes they make Jamaican chicken. They always have Indian food, which I like, but it's never, once in a while they do something I can eat. Because most things, even if they make a vegetarian stuff, they put milk in as the base, right? And as so I can always smell that milk in it, so, um, so I can't eat that. But I went to the dad now, and I said, hey, Justin, what's going on? The mom says, I keep telling her she needs to contribute. If she, you know, she can stay. But the mom's like, no. And so to me, you're, she's what? The young, young lady is about 24 years old. She's making good money. She doesn't have debt because her both parents worked at St. Leo, so she got her education for free. And so now she's just doing um, what she wants with her money because she has no responsibility, you know? And you don't ever want to do it. That's another way of messing up the child, you know? All right. So some general advice, and then we'll get to a part where we'll dive into some more stuff. It says, self-control, big deal. Do you know one of, one of the first places to start with self-control? Eating. Now, Sister White says that if we could get that under control, appetite, other things are so easy. So easy. So that's the first place, right? But we need self-control. Then say, take control of your own financial future. Because know what will happen? Others will mismanage your money for you. If you don't do it, right? If you don't learn to manage your money, and that way... Now, one of the things you will not see, uh, you would probably, you have probably heard about, um, what's this guy name? I can't remember his name now. Ramsey. Now, Ramsey has a really hard core thing. Ramsey was bankrupt like a couple of times, right? He went through some stuff. Ramsey's, uh, as far as I know, I don't know if he's a Christian, right? Uh, Dave Ramsey, he does financial seminars. But Ramsey, you have to be really one of those that is hardcore to stick on the plan. 
And so many people start Dave Ramsey. Like me, easy for me. Because, you know, I grew up without anything. I know how to do without, right? But God wants balance, you know? And so anything we talk about, you have to decide to put together a plan to take your time get out. What you don't want to do is frustrate yourself, right? Because um, his plans are really good, and a lot of churches use it. But I am telling you, sometimes it, it get to where you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do, and it may frustrate you. So start little, though, and then build on it. Know where your money goes. How many of you can tell me that, you know, I don't even know anymore, but I used to, but I know for the most part. You know, my wife and I will say, and I'll say to her, all right, here's how much we should spend here. Here's how much we should spend here. And then I have to keep track. So one of the things I do, because I practice, you know, I'm hoping my brain doesn't go away anytime soon. So I, all that she needs to do is give me the receipts, you know. And when she gives me, I'm like, okay, all right, you know, I don't know. We're eating too much food or you're buying too much food for Pierce and Jess, you know. We need, um, I said, you only have $50 left for the month. <laughs> And she said, how do you know? I said, well, because I've been doing, tabulating different things, right? And so you need to know where your money goes, especially the less money you make, the more you need to know where it goes, okay? And start an emergency fund. If you have, start with something small, you know? It, it, it doesn't have to be big. Start with something small. And if you get tax returns, I know most people look forward to their tax return to go blow it on something. What I normally say, if you get a good tax return, I said, treat your, you know, if husband and wife, treat yourselves to a little thing, not too big, mm -hmm. if it's an individual. But most of that, if you are not paying off debt, you should be start, starting to save something, okay? And, um, you know, we'll talk about saving a country property later on. Right? We're not going to dive too much into it, but uh, I would suggest that if possible, you know, you should start thinking about that. It says, surround yourself with individuals who share your values. And we start right here. Okay? And hope, no, we don't share the same values, all of us, financial wise, but it's not just that. But you should make sure you're not around people who are people who waste money. Because then you will start feeling bad. I know my, my daughter, she sacrificed um, the relationships with her friends because. They would always want to go out and spend. And she's like, no, Pierce and I are saving towards so and so and so. Uh, but they would always want to go out and spend and spend a lot of uh, money. And so because of that, they pretty much cut her off. Well, that was a good cut off, right? Because none of them, as far as I know, none of them have a house, you know, and um, stuff. So make sure you're surrounding yourself with uh, people who share your values. Don't compromise your integrity for money. It is so easy to say, but, I have to, but, but no. When it comes to integrity, especially from a biblical standpoint, don't. Don't sacrifice your integrity for money. And notice I said steady diligence is the way to wealth. Okay? There, I heard a story about this lady. She donated $150,000 to a university, and I can't remember where it was, um, that it made the news, you know, they were saying, this woman was, she had a small type job in a, I think, you know, some company, but she, they said, where did you get that money from? She said, I just kept saving it. I just kept saving. And she never got the chance to get a college degree, but she wanted to help those, so she donated it to help others to get a college degree. And, that, and she saved, right? But most of us, we don't know how to save. We want what we want, and we want it right now, you know? And we'll even put ourselves in debt, you know? Avoid get-rich-quick schemes. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. You remember Madoff? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Bernie, yes. And you know what? An intelligent people fell for that. How could you be earning? What was so good about him that he could give you such high returns when the returns were not there? You know? 
And, and that has to do with the people in my profession. We should have known better. When they, they, should have, they should have, especially those in the SEC, there should have been an audit to say that doesn't make sense. There's no way the market could be earning 6% and you're giving away 18%. Cannot happen. Not going to happen. You know, but people are greedy. They want everything, right? So, and then time is money. I mean, use your time wisely. You know, um, use your, when I didn't have a job, let me tell you, every day I was in New York City, uh, I would take the train in and I was walking around trying to find a job till I eventually found a job, right? The accumulation of money is a means to an end. Don't accumulate money just because you're greedy. You know, money is just to serve us. Because, you know, eventually some of us serve money. Like, we hoard money, right? There's a point where, and here's what I'm saying. Earlier I told you that, you know, I store up treasures. One day I was talking to my wife and I said, hmm, I wonder if we were to have kept, a tr kept track of how much money um, we put in God's store or so much. And I said, you know what, that probably wouldn't have been a good thing. Probably God would have slapped us like he did to David when David numbered <laughs> the children of Israel. There are some things you best not know. And so what we do, my wife and I have no problem when people are in need or the church needs something, we pull in savings and say, here. Now, you know, because you know what? There will come a time when that money is not good to us anyway. Yes, It, it, it will. Use it in the church, right? Use it in church. And so we should, and, and listen, let me say this, and I say this with respect to we're doing a good job here. I've been in churches where they, and here's why I can say that. I've been in churches where every, almost every other week, some guest speaker coming in and they're doling out money, Right? To these guests and I'm like what are you doing we have nine elders in the church why do we need all these guest speakers right and 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 no joke my wife and I there are some churches I don't think will bring me back because they were offended that my wife gave them back the check you know um, that she's like no we don't take the church's money you know the church's money is the church's money and um, and I'm not saying if someone travels from afar and they, you know, reimbursing their gas, you know, stuff like that. But I've been in churches where I, I served uh, at a church where I was one of the assistant treasurers. It was a bigger church. And you have people coming in. They want to stay in nice hotels. They want to be in, some of them want to rent a car. Some of them want to fly first class. And then they want $500. But you know what? Never stop me from putting money in the storehouse because God will hold them responsible, not me, right? So when I say we're doing a good job, we're not, you don't see that happening here, right? Um, says, all right, so let's talk about these a little bit and then we'll get into this more, right? So we're going to be wrapping up in the next um, 10 minutes or so. So one, we will dive into this. We'll really dive into this. And for those who came later at the end, you will see my email address. When you look at this PowerPoint slide on your computer, it will look so much different, right? It, the, this screen is different. So whenever we get into finance, to, to get to financial freedom, the first thing, always pray, right? Always pray. Everything you do, pray. Ask God to reveal to you what it is that you need to do. And I am telling you, he will. John 16, 13 say, how be it when he, the what? The spirit of truth is come, what will he do? He will guide us into all truth. So we need to pray, right? Then we need to track our current ex uh, spending. Do you know many, I've, I've, every church I've gone to that's local that I can get to, I've always tossed out. I will sit with you as an individual, I'll sit with you as a couple or a family, whatever, 
And every time I tell folks, this is the first thing you need to do. Because if you're not willing to track your expenses, I cannot help you. And I can't, t and then I had one time someone, well, it happened a number of times. I tell them, you have to be willing to do this for three months. There's a reason why it has to be done for three months. Generally, in a three-month period, the majority of your expenses come up. And I remember someone tracked the first month, and I guess it looked good. And, I, and she said to me, can you, I said, no, can't help you. I said, I need two more months. If, I said, you didn't fall into debt overnight, and you're not going to come out overnight. Three months not going to push you any further in debt if you decide right now that you're going to not get into any more debt. And the person I saw, I didn't hear from them in, uh, you know, after the three months. I said, ah, oh, I decided it. It looks too bad. I'm not, I didn't know what to say. It looks too bad, so you're not going to do it? What kind of madness is that? That's like saying, God, you know what? My sin's so terrible. Ah, just leave me alone. All right? So we need to do that. Budget. We need to, after, you cannot establish a really good budget till after you have tracked your, your current expense. See, uh, when I worked in finance, I worked for 17 years before I left to go have fun teaching. And 10 of those years was in finance, were in finance. And I am telling you, we don't go creating a budget without having history. You need history, right? And so you need to establish a budget after you track your expenses. And then what we'll do is as time passes, right, I will show you here if you want me to help you, right, you want to compare your actual spending to your budget. Why? Because then you have to decide where adjustments need to be made. So it says analyze the differences. Like for instance, we, were at, we had a house one time and we kept working on it and um, I finally had to put a line item on our budget called Home Depot. Because, but that was good because we were doing the work ourselves. We were just buying stuff, right? And my wife said, oh, I feel bad. I said, no. If we had to pay for the labor, the labor would probably be three times as much, right? We just took our time, time and did it. So analyze the difference. Then we decide where adjustments are needed. And usually it's for the better, not to make it worse. Not to, oh, well, you know, I think we can eat out a little more. Talking about that, let me tell you what happened to a, a couple I was, um, I was um, uh, helping, you know, I was consulting with. And then they got rid of me. But it's fine. They weren't paying me. I didn't ask for pay. I didn't want pay. So, you know, it's not like they cost me any money. They just wanted to do their own thing. So they were tracking their expenses, and I'm guiding them through it every month. I said, all right, yeah, good, keep doing that. And, um, and then I'm like, why is it that your grocery bill is so low when it's two of you and two kids? I say, you know, and it, something I'd been nagging me, I said, what are you not telling me? And they go, and you know, no, you know, we buy this. I said, no, no, no. Them kids don't look like they're starving. And you two look like you eat well. What's going on? You know what they would do? They would buy Burger King and McDonald's instead of buying groceries and cooking, right? So I said, can either of you cook? Both of them could cook. I said, why? Well, we're too, bu too busy. So now you're wasting money buying all these empty calories, right? And you're not doing, and after, you know, we talk about that, then they fired me. But that's okay, you know, because it was either them firing me or I, I was going to fire them, right? Because they, and I said, so what does, they couldn't tell me. I, so I said, all right. So I threw out a number. I said, all right, let's say you buy only dinner every that. And I did some, I'm like, do you realize how much you're spending? And I said, I know you're spending way more than that. I, and they could, and I told them, I said, based on my family, you could be spending so much less if you would just stay home, you know, cook. You know, and, and my wife even said to them, here's how you could cook and have like a few meals on Sundays when you're not working, and then you could kind of just eat some of it at different times, right? If you don't want to eat the same, because I'm not, I'm like that. I don't want to eat, whatever I eat today, I don't want to eat tomorrow. 
So when we cook on the weekends for that, and now we don't have to worry, you know, either I'm home cooking or Kain is home cooking, but we used to cook like three different meals. So we may have this Monday, but another one, you know, but we had enough meal for the week, right? Um, but people waste their money um, that way. So deciding on adjustments doesn't mean, hey, listen, you know, let's start eating out more. You shouldn't even be trying to eat out anymore. You don't even know what they're feeding you, okay? They, you know, when I eat the vegetables from our backyard, and then I eat vegetables that my wife buys, like, it's so different. And unfortunately, and I have to say this, you know, I don't mean to embarrass Anna, but I, the best salad I've had is from their backyard, Anna's and, uh, and Jerry's back, because it's so, how should, I feel like I'm eating something, right? And so the way they, they you know, Anna packed us up, or Jerry, one of them, or both, <laughs> packed us up some salad, and I ate that for like three days. Poor kind, she didn't get she got a little bit. I let her eat the one she bought, you know, and I ate the one. But it was so good. It actually tastes like food. But sometimes you get the stuff in the store, it tastes like nothing is in it, you know. And so it's good if we can do our own, you know, buy our own things, but grow it if we can. All right. List debts from smallest to largest. And we'll go back through this again. Why do we need to list our debts from smallest to largest? So quick, why, what does that do? It frees up more money, but it has something, it does something for you. Positive. You feel good. Trust me, every time you pay off another, you feel good. And you want to pay off the next one, right? And so, yes, it frees up money to do that, but it also makes you feel good. And we want to feel good. Okay? And then we keep going. And which one of the debt generally is the one that we should pay off last? Your mortgage. Generally. That's the one, right? There are situations where you may want to get your house paid off and all that. But generally speaking, that's where you want to go. And so you keep adding, adding all of that, right? Now, where did um, the wise man tell us to go? Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Wasn't talking about you guys. You're not sluggards. All right. Say, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provided her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. If ant, and by the way, you know, I used to believe years ago when they used to say, oh, animals, they just go off of instinct. I don't believe that foolishness anymore. Those things have intelligence, okay? I watch, ever since we got rid of cable and we just watch nature program, I have seen when they're videotape animals, how they treat, I, I'll give you an example. I was watching a thing where two lion pride kind of got into a little situation and I was going, I knew they were going to be fighting and so, I'm like, ah, I'm going to switch it to another pro. But for whatever reason, you know, it's like something. So w keep watching and see what happens. And one of, the animal, one of the younger females in one of the tribe got trapped in with the more dominant um, tr uh, pride and because she had been hurt. And the others left her, and they start going, and they, re they heard her cry because... They, one of the other ones bit her, you know, on her leg. And they stopped. And it, it's like, they re, man, they heard one of their family members. And I said, so what are they going to do? Are they going to kill this thing? And the narrator is like, you know, they thought they could kill her right now. And they kept, they bit her in little places. I didn't realize how badly they were hurting her. And she was yet, and then finally the matriarch, Right, because there are no, um, there are no adult uh, male lion in there. And, one, and the matriarch, the lioness, she literally comes, left the pack, by, and she walks up, and they look like they were going to attack her, and she just put on, and put on her head. And they say, that's her yielding and say, you guys are better. You know? And then that pride just left, because they're like, that, that pride knows they have dominance over them now. The, the bad thing is they, because they took so long to yield, the poor 
animal died, you know? But I've seen so many, I'm like, God has put certain amount of intelligence in. You think ant just by instinct, that's what they would try and tell you, right? But God, so we can learn so much, you know, from it. Don't go watching all these nature programs, you know, watch more sermons. But, you know, I, I don't think God would send us to the ant if there's nothing for us to learn. So, Today I wanted to get through some basic stuff. Tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to talk about managing family finances, but that will help with um, personal. Now, we, are we going to talk about different plans, right? Because there are certain plans that are out there that are not good, and obviously you will see that they're not good. Then there's one that seems good, but it can still be better, right? So tomorrow we're going to focus in on talking about financial you know plans that work that manage uh, people manage within their their homes and it it's sometimes it's not good you know and it creates a lot of problems right it creates a lot of problems so we will repeat some stuff right um, over the next couple of days that hopefully um, tomorrow we'll get some questions right you know and remember we can talk to each other uh, about this again if you want I know some people when it comes to finances people are more private you can always talk to me right? you know if you need to talk you can talk to me I will one thing I will my wife will tell you when it comes to people's financial business it's their business you know I know it's like well you know and I'm in the field where whatever I discuss with one student has to be with that student right if it's private stuff so I can assure you that if you need help, I can help you, but you have to be willing to want the help. And remember this, keep this in mind, it's not going to just happen, there's my email address if you need to contact me, if you want the slides, right? It's not going to just happen overnight, right? Now, yeah, can God cause someone to just give you a windfall for you to pay off? Of course, God can do whatever. Bible tells us the cattle up, up on a thousand hills are his. So usually when Kain and I need funds, I actually pray, God, sell a cattle and send me the money. Literally. And she's like, what do you do? I said, well, the cattle up on a thousand hills are his, and I have no cattle. So I want one of his, right? And he usually takes care of it. And I am not joking when I say he does that. I remember I promised the church, $2,000 one time I was in this church and I thought I was writing $200 and Allison and I wrote $2,000 my wife said do you know what you just wrote and I said what do you mean $200 and she said no you just wrote $2,000 I said well I didn't write that so God gonna have to give me that money and I turned in the card I could have taken another card but I'm like if God had me put that he wants me to put that money and I didn't know where it was coming from. So then as a, a, a numbers guy, I quickly calculated in my head. I'm like, okay, if we gave $100, you know, because I knew we had the $200 in savings that we could give. But I said, all right, if I give $100 every month for the end of the year when they need it, I would have covered $800. So I worked out the plan. I said, come December, I'm going to write them an IOU for $1,200. <laughs> Literally, that's what I said. And... Long story short, in October, my company, they are no, no, November, I left one company, went to the next company, and because I joined them early, they gave me a bonus for $8,000. After the tax man took more, because bonuses, they tax bigger, right? We got like $5,600 off that. I paid off the commitment. Kain still had like $2,000 left on our student loan. I paid that off and we could still do something with other money. So I'm not saying that's always going to be the case, but think about your help, right? Some of us still have help because we have been faithful to God. Some of us, it's because of our faithfulness to God while he continues to protect our children and do this and do that. So don't always expect that it's going to be financial terms, right? It's so many ways God blesses us if we are faithful to him. Any questions before we wrap up? All right, so tomorrow, same time, 6.30, we're going to focus in, like I said, on family finances, right? Finances is not a topic most people want to hear about because they prefer to be, uh, you know, what 
typically pay, people say ostriches I don't know that they do this stick their heads in the ground but if you do that your body is wide open to be hurt right? you still need to know what's going on so we're going to talk about family finances I um, again if there are personal things you want to talk to me about you know I'll be here all right all right let us stand and pray Father, as we come before you once again, I want to thank you so much that you give us the privilege to discuss things that are not always easy for some of us to talk about. And so, Lord, I pray that something that was said, something you put in the minds of us will help us to realize that we, we can get on the path, the path to becoming uh, financially free from debt, which we will discuss um, on, um, on Sabbath. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to invite you know, our friends, encourage our friends and our family members to come hear some of the stuff, and that we would trust you to, to guide us, to tell us what, what it is we need to do, and that we would have the strength, the strength of character, to do that which you show us to do so that we can start becoming more financially independent of this world. In Jesus' name, amen.